Good evening. It's great to see quite a number of friends and allies in the audience and most of Alan Shearer's class. <laughs> and I, I blame Professor Shearer for this whole thing. I always want to make that clear, right? Yes, you were the first one to tell us we should do this. I've never forgotten it. I'm not sure I've forgiven you either. Um, that's the bad part. The really good part's what you're getting to hear tonight from um, Gulliver Shepherd, principal with Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates, whom for those of you who are not in the trade, won Firm of the Year Award in August. So congratulations on that. It's really a wonderful <laughs> honor. When we first were told by the jury that they had selected Michael Van Valkenburg, for those of you who don't know, we had a national jury and we had nothing to do with the selection. That was very, very smart of us in this political town. Um, the jury, and Alan was one of the members of the jury, when they first told us that they had chosen MVVA, we were told that part of the reason was because of the strength of the people MVVA brought to the table. So it's no surprise that Gulliver comes with all the things you would expect. Harvard training, experience in such major projects as Brooklyn Bridge Park, the Javis Plaza in New York City, the White House Pennsylvania uh, project, the master plan for Princeton, and most recently, the reimagining of the land around the Great Arch in St. Louis, where he got his undergraduate degree at Washington University. What we didn't expect, and what we really had no right to get, but what we have gotten in Gulliver, is a man with great patience, which God knows you need in this project. Enormous rigor. The rigor, it asserts itself in the most unexpected moments when I think anyone else would have given up um, holding to the quality that we all want and hope that we deserve for this city, but will be remarkable for us when it's finished. I think his tolerance for complexity is just mind-boggling because our creek, in case you don't know, was a dump for many, many years. And everything that didn't belong in it is in it. And a whole lot of things that should have been in it are not in it. And that makes for a wicked problem, in the words of Professor Shear. Most of all, I think um, Gulliver has demonstrated an immense capacity for leadership and a commitment to excellence that never wavers. Personally, I attribute all of these attributes to his mother, of course, <laughs> right? Just want to say that? Because I know that his mother is, is a distinguished anthropologist who had the wisdom to take him away to Nepal and Ethiopia and all the places in the world that we should see if we're going to really understand architecture and landscape architecture and landscape. I have to say, though, that I know when you see his presentation, you will agree with me that it's really impossible now to imagine Austin without Gulliver. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? All right, great. Um, well, uh, thank you for coming to this event instead of the perfectly posh uh, pink uh, event downstairs. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, it was good to hear Greg talk about uh, the purpose of Imagine Austin. And uh, let me explain um, what we're hoping to do here. Um, we want to uh, show you um, not necessarily what we're doing at Waller Creek first, but we want to talk about how our firm tackles jobs that are immensely complex, demanding great deals of patience, <laughs> and what we've been able to do with them. Because I think it's always hard uh, when confronted with a wicked problem or something that it seems insurmountable. How do, you, how do you actually solve for something that has so many burdens and so many high-minded goals? And, it, and in, in that uh, sort of message, we also, uh, it's been a very important uh, journey, both personally, but also in the last 10, 15 years, 
what landscape architecture is becoming. It is sort of finding a, a place in tackling just that. And that's sort of starting to get to uh, the title of, of talking about landscape as a medium for strategic thinking. And strategic thinking isn't just like some super smart person letting us all know what we should be doing. It's about creative dialogue and how you push each other for more value in, in decision making processes. So I w a little bit about um, MBDA and our firm. Um, in practice, you don't get a lot of opportunities to self-reflect about what you do. Um, and this was a really important moment uh, for us in the firm in uh, 2006. We were asked to do an exhibit um, at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard um, titled Between Form and Circumstance. And it was about how we think about landscape and how we understand site-based design. It wasn't between form and program. In other words, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't between form and craft, although we care about those things very much. What it was acknowledging is that we immerse ourselves deeply in the site and the research content of that. And I think that's something we, now in the 10 years we hear all the time about landscape architecture, about this expanding terrain, that a site is never empty. You know, it is already full of so much. Um, even though you might call Waller Creek a dump, there is so much in it that it has uh, all sorts of values. You may not always agree with them, but <laughs> there's a lot. So 10 years later, this uh, interest and just passion about immersing yourself in sight has now taken on a lot of new dimensions, um, both aided by technology, um, but also when confronted sites that are you might not want to call wall or natural, but it is. There are a lot of parts of it. Um, but something that isn't captured in a survey or a drawing, because you know normally a tree is represented as a circle. Um, but when you go out there, it's anything but. And then, then the species, there's layers and layers of information that you have to just mine through direct experience. But then how do you record that and then try to draw something as a design? It becomes very challenging. So we have armed ourselves with all sorts of tools that technology has offered us lately. Um, projects uh, all over the country where we suddenly are strapping GoPros onto kayaks, GPS receivers onto our hats, so we can actually map um, our experiences into the drawings and we can actually calibrate um, the sort of mining of place. And the upper left is something that uh, in the last so a year ago in doing the framework plan for this project, we would take teams of uh, ecologists, hydrologists um, with their muck boots on and walk up and down the creek and spend hours understanding what this place was and designing in sight in the field. We've also been, been blessed with now a whole new set of tools with drones, um, being able to overlay all this information we collect from the field with many other data sources um, and modeling. So we're, we're extremely, uh, and Waller Creek really is set up to be a very interesting case for how all of this might come together in forming a new plan. So now uh, I want to talk about just how, you know, 10, 15 years ago, suddenly in the market, there was always a landscape right in the middle of, it was sort of always the sort of in the center of the poster child of big city projects. Landscape became incredibly important into the idea of the city. If, if it wasn't already, and, but it's much more put out there as a sort of a new idea of landscape. And so part of that is uh, we obviously know um, the Knight Foundation has run projections about how right now 50% uh, of the globe lives in cities. And that trend is only going to increase. That cities are becoming increasingly packed with people, economic opportunity, the kind of um, experiences that people desire. So 75% of the globe by 2050 will be uh, in cities. That puts urban systems under tremendous pressure um, in all sorts, as if it wasn't pressured enough already. And then increasingly, uh, urban groups are becoming more vocal. And then really important issues, access to things like open space, equity, accessibility, and inclusivity. And we've been 
finding that landscape, and I'll go into this, is really well positioned to help foster this convergence of interest in the formulation in these uh, places to make these things actually happen. So landscape doesn't have a prescribed program. It's, it's, I, I actually, my background is in architecture originally, and it was always, we want you know, 10,000 square feet of this, 5,000 square feet of this, this many bathrooms. We don't get that in landscape, and I am, I'm actually really grateful for that. <laughs> landscape is what it is in a lot of ways. It is incredibly adaptable, and that's part of the magic. Um, it, its materiality is also very basic. It's understandable, relatable. Um, now that might be seeming like I'm putting it down, but I think that's part of where the power of landscape architecture right now in sort of taking on complexity is it itself has certainly science and complexity in that level, but in terms of our experience of it, there's some base experiences we all share. And it's, that's, I think, a powerful part of using landscape to solve these problems. And then it's profoundly free because it is not a $10 million, you know, patch of land, it, it's very adaptable in how you manipulate it. And I would say that almost every project in our office right now started with goals or more abstract ideas, no programs. And, and like this one, we got 10 goals. So that, that was certainly an indication of the wickedness of the problem. <laughs> so scales, principles, values, this is how we're using, that's the target. And so I want to talk about some of these projects that we've done that have this complex set of, you know, uh, goals and challenges um, and how landscape is adaptable in each one to take on these things in, in incredibly different ways and methodologies. And they all reflect on Waller Creek. This is just the competition boards back in a few years back, but this how we were so excited about Waller Creek uh, in terms of just the inventive potential of what this place could be because in a way it was so, it was run down, it was, everything was about to change and to harness this, this incredible set of issues that is a city, you know, gentrification, inclusivity, accessibility, um, the valuation of nature, all this stuff was, is, is incredibly complicated. And, Tackling it as one and, and to fuse that into a single landscape medium is, is so intriguing to us. So I'm going to go through a couple of these things just talking about inventions, how landscape was inventive through very complex topics. And first uh, is the one of jurisdiction. And talking about Brooklyn Bridge Park in Brooklyn. Um, so I guess everyone pretty, pretty much at least as a stereotype can imagine that living in New York is complicated in general. <laughs> it's, it's dense, it's, you know, all, it's just you've got things everywhere that you have to know about to not get a ticket, to not get fined, to not, you know, get in the wrong place, the wrong subway stop. Now imagine trying to build in that environment. Um, it gets more complicated with all sorts of rules. And then you add into, a, into that a waterfront that cuts across every jurisdictional boundary that pretty much exists in the city and tried to build it. So we were, I mean, uh, a waterfront is like, um, you know, it's like you have to be a palm reader. There, every line has so many, you know, predictions about the past and uh, in the future. And we, we started to map these things, but it, it didn't even get to the uh, real complexity of it. Because um, it's also about a living, breathing city uh, f full of many people and processes that would be almost Byzantine, uh, that are Byzantine. This is a diagram of we're in the middle just because we had to see the whole scene of how often the outer rings are um, less often and the inner rings are more often. And the quadrants are city, state, federal, and community. It's just a massive amount of thinking with other people, other influences. So talking about waterfronts, this, this place had a very interesting history and it's so much about um, the marine eco cargo economy and what a waterfront was for a city like this. Um, you know, we all imagine maybe when you see New York, the historic finger piers, which were essentially extensions of streets where they would offload on from boats 
onto our vehicles and they would drive down the street to warehouses. Our site was de originally developed in the uh, 40s where they had come up with a new idea of just off, don't double handle this stuff, just load it into a, a uh, warehouse right there on the water. Of course, this idea didn't last very long. Um, 15 years later, they invented the container and the containers took over the entire market and it, so that's that the, our site was rendered basically uh, useless to this industry in the 80s. Um, so th this is why the site became available and why um, it was being asked to be turned into uh, a park or a public space. Um, but that, but the, the leftover was this massive infrastructure um, from the marine cargo industry, uh, the, all the marine engineering, which is, you know, when you, when you pull in billions of dollars a year of revenue from that uh, business, it's fine to maintain, but when it becomes a park, it's an entirely a different story. And we had a, um, all of these edges that, and I'm, I'm serious, these, to build these things cost some in the order of $10,000 a linear foot to repair. And we knew this from many other projects in New York at the time. Again, this is one of these really hard problems, but we took, this was a pivotal moment of th thinking about all of these structures along this edge. If it was red, we're gonna rip it out and we're gonna change it. And, and, the other, and then if it's green, we're good, we're gonna use that to build on yellow, TBD. Um, what's, what's fascinating is we looked at all the other parks in New York City from the vantage point of a boat, which I guess people didn't do. It was always about coming from the land. And we realized none of, none of the parks actually touched the water. This was like a completely not done thing. So suddenly the idea of tearing out edges and putting a new edge back was an amazing opportunity. What we didn't know is that that actually further, the reason why people were just decking over this stuff is that you got into all sorts of infrastructure and jurisdictional problems. So let me look at one part of it. That's Pier 1, it's an 11 acre shed for storing all sorts of stuff at the time. Um, so it is uh, part on uh, earth and part on piles, the structures uh, that would, would cost just millions of dollars to build. And our whole idea was in the start of this was to pull back that structure, and it, which includes a clearing in the pile field for, um, is it the NR line? I think one of the subway lines in the city. Um, and start to build a whole new set of edges that allow you to experience a different type of landscape and a different kind of experience of the water that you could not do. And this is images of us during uh, the demo piece just starting to peel back um, this elaborate landscape of this uh, uh, post-industrial um, uh, use. And so you can see the tracks of the subway in here and then also along the edge here was the former waterfront where a whole series of um, water and collection structures had failed. It was part of the red on that diagram. And so as we were um, planning the park, we had the very deftly sort of almost like jazz improv around how to both negotiate with people like um, the DEP who, who wanted to ask us to rebuild every um, sewer outfall on the site, which would have just destroyed the budget and we wouldn't have had a project because we were gonna put our stormwater into the system. And if those of you who aren't familiar, the combined sewer outfalls are sanitary and the stormwater mixing together. And in New York, the, you get fined huge amounts by the EPA when you have too much rain and it starts pushing all the bad stuff out into our waterways. Um, so this was a very serious issue. So we took on the task of not allowing any stormwater to go into CSOs so we didn't have to pay for it. So this is just one of the sort of deft improv things we had to start learning and, and learning to deal with all of these jurisdictions, the subways. Um, they uh, basically, they understand and build around, they maintain the tunnels all the time and they also build buildings around subways all the time, but the parts where they plunge underneath the river it basically took us to a room and said, all those people are dead. We don't know. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk about this, you know, this sort of uh, jazz improv of moving around jurisdictional constraints um, to bring uh, a 
a sort of a whole repertoire of new views of how to design. And you know, here, is it away from you? No. Um, this area here, the salt marsh, something that has largely been um, uh, eradicated in the uh, New York area. Most cities are located on estuaries where there's an exchange of waters, and these only exist within a certain horizon of, of these uh, uh, landscapes. So we were able to restore something that was really incredible um, uh, in terms of the, the programs in the city. We're trying to find ways to do it, but the wakes from boats don't let you. And then a whole series of freshwater gardens. You see along that, the main esplanade here, horizontally across the image. Above that is a series of water gardens that we cross and interact with that treated all our stormwater, ripped out that expensive structure that we couldn't rebuild and um, treated it so we didn't have to spend uh, multiple millions of dollars in rebuilding CSOs. And it, as a narrative then, the, f the sort of fluvial nature of moving in and out of these water gardens into the uh, park lawns, seeing the Statue of Liberty there on the right and being revealed to the bay, finding the salt marsh, which um, turns out also to have been an amazing uh, buffer for uh, the uh, Superstorm Sandy effects, and the park survived amazingly, more than most of the parks in the city. And going on down the line, making beaches and allowing people to actually get to the water. We're wired to be, you know, curious and, and react to this. And it's, it was amazing how powerful this idea had been and did not exist. And purely coming out of a dance with jurisdiction. Um, this is another one over a subway tube, a sort of tidal in the, no one even realized that in New York we have tidal influence until we started to express this, that as the water would go up and down, this boat launch slash just sort of folly would fill differently in plan. So that was um, very exciting for us and we became incredibly educated about how to start talking about jurisdiction and how that could actually open up design, not just be like frowny face, like you don't have to do anything. So another big hairy project dealt with the issue of preservation. And this is in St. Louis at the St. Louis Arch, uh, 90 acres of highway, riverfront, and um, his national historic landmark landscape. Um, this is a project that basically was set up in such a way that people said, I'm not going to be able to do this. Because the National Park Service's mission is to protect and to not change. And this, we were set up by a comp another competition <laughs> to make radical change. This project, which is currently under construction, is uh, being billed as the number one economic development project for the region, and it's a landscape. There's no malls, no, you know, some sort of commercial venue. It's purely doing something about what was here, which was a federal island uh, for the National Park Service. I mean, it's very weird to have a, a federal protected historic landmark national park in the city, because the city has to grow. The city's all about growing, and they were about, we are protecting this. Even though there is no natural resource, there's really in just an abstract concept of history that this was marking, it had this line of not changing. And that is defined in the whole history of this thing. It was the arch designed by Erosarinen is truly an amazing symbol and it succeeded tremendously in this. It's as a structural system, it was sort of likened to like um, landing on the moon. It was such an advanced, interesting way they built this thing. Uh, people still talk about it. I was there. And then um, highways were invented along during the process of this project and it became sort of one of the major leverage points for one of the first highways in the country. But its intent um, was really to be a living memor uh, memorial to the idea of westward expansion. And this, is, this, this got lost in the shuffle. And this is really what this project was about. And this may be the longest continuously planned and designed project out there. 70 years. And we come in at the end hopefully to take the credit. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, um, the images I just showed and what everyone remembers is in that little uh, black bar, part of the bar within that 70 years, uh, the original competition won in 1947. 
arch. Uh, Erosernan never saw the arch built. He died before it was completed, and uh, they fired Dan Kiley, the landscape architect. Um, and then in, then in the process, this wave of legislation in this country about historic preservation, environmental protection, building highways, all of this stacked up, and they added a highway to the site on top of federal parkland. So, and then, then they started, what happened is the Park Service, which was a visionary thing, started to just get into a simplified mode of, of, of sort of interpreting hist landscape history and design and, um, and found all these great little structures to adjudicate change and determine whether or not um, change was possible. And, and this is to the tune of being in a room with 20 people for two weeks to decide on an HVA system re retrofit. And they're very proud of this. Yeah, so they, there's a whole thing called a, um, I'm just blanking on the name. It's a, a process, they, have a, they give you the book, and like this is how we make decisions. You usually can't make it without it. And, it w and here we are trying to ch radically change 90 acres of National Historic Landmark. It was, this is getting to the impossibility of this project. Um, coming in at the end to try to do this. But the only thing that got our foot in the door here is that this is an infrastructure, that this is, there are 400 national park sites across the country. Um, they, are four, yeah, and there's um, 280 million visitors a year. Um, and it's, and it's a, a, a precious infrastructure that is either flatlining or in decline because of its relevance to our, in our current culture. It's also incredibly tied to a giant economic factor in this country. Um, there's probably not a lot of people who have heard about the outdoor uh, recreation economy. It's sort of the sleeping giant in our country. The, um, if you think about the, the national, or sort of the annual um, produced value for cars and auto parts, that's about uh, 364 billion. This industry garners 646. It's a giant, and if you might remember, a few years ago there was a governmental shutdown. So two days after that, they opened up back all the national parks because it was having such an impact on the economies. So to have this infrastructure fail, like most, like many that are in this country, is a real crisis. So that was a, a huge motivation, but yet we have the National Park Service, which is basically organized like a military <laughs> organization. That's, that basically each of these little places are like a frontier military outpost. They don't, they don't, they don't interact in their communities, and there's a local set of soldiers that are guarding their turf. <laughs> so how do you how do you do this? <laughs> and then the conversations that you have is beyond the absurd in this mission of preservation education. They are often still in the sort of 50s mode of like you drag your kids in the car and you go learn, damn it. <laughs> um, um, and it's, and even Saarinen was critical of this at the time that he was working on the zone. He's like, I am not going to drive a thousand miles to look at a gold spike in a glass case. <laughs> um, and that, you know, now there's so much more, uh, you know, just a dialogue about how people learn and how people understand through crafting experiences. And this is, um, and it's not just being presented with the material. So, okay, how, how, how did, how is landscape um, sort of was strategic in this perspective? I mean, you see a landscape plan and it's what you expect. There's a big green shape in the middle of the city. And yes, we, we do get to do that. And, and people are ha happy with seeing that. But the, the reality um, was how we got change to start occurring. And it was leveraging all the externalities. There's a whole, it's literally uh, over a hundred small projects that are all towards one purpose, which is to reconnect, this is the name of the project, the City Arch River. These things exist in total isolation right now because of the, the, the site being um, totally shrouded with barriers and highways. This, Sound familiar, right? <laughs> this is a frequent thing. Um, but uh, so each of these things we took on you know, different tactics to, that would be, could be 
offered into the Park Service a conversation about how to think about change. Um, and there's some interesting pieces. Sorry, it's so washed out. Um, the site is entirely inaccessible from the modern day sense of slopes and having, it's not, it's not just, I mean, there's a 45 foot staircase between the, the uh, riverfront and, and the arch. So we found a way to be able to start talking to them about how to make changes in pieces of landscape that had no purpose but just to uh, hold some plants as scenic um, to, to start engaging people and being able to use the riverfront again. Um, that it'll be really important when I explain that more. The arch grounds, as I said, is by attacking the edges and being able to create a connective belt buckle around the being able to go to the arch and not just go on the death march to visit the, th <laughs> the thing, <laughs> um, but actually be able to pass through to <laughs> treat it as part of the city, like run, bike, do all, all sorts of things. And the key to that is this parking garage on the north end, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then um, high, a series of highway interventions. We had to take on the highway directly. Um, it's 180 feet of just concrete traffic, noise, and unpleasantness. And this was the most potent symbolic part of uh, sort of bringing this federal thing to engage with its community, which is basically not in the DNA of the National Park Service. So one of the dirty secrets was they had given uh, over easements to the, uh, the feds on national park land. Um, so the national park land has highways on it. That never happens. It can't happen. In, in their system. But so one of the products so that we were able to leverage is if we modify the highway system and we and it would extend into changing the whole circulation in the downtown grid and move ramps, we could gain you back 11 acres of, of your parkland to actually call as park. They were really happy about that. Um, and then in terms of being able to understand the site as this is the only place you can actually get to the river from downtown. There's a massive port and a massive industrial area that's lined with flood protection walls because it is the Mississippi. And you have a 50 foot change in elevation. And then that whole perimeter, how to transform the edge of a highway and a collector road. And then of course, Homeland Security had entered into the mix just recently when we got there and be able to say, can we just come in a little bit and craft uh, sort of these paths for people to bike and move in and out? And that's part of also the claimed land that was formerly roadway by the changes of ramps we had done. But perhaps the, the most important um, and symbolic piece of this was how to connect it to the city. We, this is really why we moved all the highway ramps change traffic in the city um, to be able to afford something that was envisioned originally by um, Saarinen and Kylie about these alleys that sort of compress and open up as you approach the arch. Now two of them exist uh, on, one the sh on the long axis of the arch, but the one that has the view through the hoop uh, didn't. Um, and so they were uh, very interested in the restoration of this and it's really a great thing where you go from the scale of the city to the sort of land of the giants of the arch, which is an amazing experience. So what you saw was sort of this front yard treatment in front of the arch, and, and this is where we're preparing to start building this um, land bridge. It took them uh, three hours to knock these things down, cleaned it up, 18 hours to erect all, all the steel for, for this, and this was a really important symbolic moment because now we had contaminated the federal land. We had actually our client said, you know, we've boarded it, <laughs> <We've> like, <laughs> like pirates. <laughs> we're, we're now we're in. And then you know this is the moment where um, they started getting nervous. And this is a thing at the Park Service too. If at any point they can start to try to pull out, there's this thing called cumulative um, change. Uh, cumulative impact, excuse me. And it's sort of a little bit like the Jehovah Witnesses calculating the end of the world. It's a, there's no real metric. They just tell you when it, you've reached it. Um, 
So they started to try to tear things down, and we, um, but luckily we had documented things so well that it, we uh, got, there's some, uh, a court that resolves conflicts between uh, different federal entities, and because the federal highways had done the proper process of, of working through this, and, and they had been party to it, we, we kept that in. The landscape starts to come in, and as they're forming a new museum entrance to the arch, and the vision is now there's actually an, an address to the city that the arch has, because right now you're supposed to just disappear on your legs and find your way around. And you've turned what was basically a ride that people would go up and enjoy into now you're moving them through an uh, exhibit tree that existed there today, but 80% of the people who went there never saw. So, I mean, and that didn't matter to the Park Service. So we've been able to capture a whole bunch of different goals here about actually engaging the content um, that was part of really bringing uh, this project to fruition. Another, another just really huge symbolically important part of this was the parking garage that sat in that sort of upside down ear shape there on the, on the site. It, the road coming in and the highway going across there had basically severed, drawn and quartered the city and where they could not have any access between them. So you had a, a great thriving commercial area, a sort of divey bar scene in the historic district because no one could ever get there. Um, and then a, one of the only thriving pieces in downtown St. Louis, an art, uh, art loft district, Washington Avenue, that landed you right here. And so this is the garage, which they had just paid off the bond for. So this was really an accomplishment that this, this had to go down. Our bike loop couldn't work. Um, we couldn't connect those four quarters of the world and bring access so you can move from one place, um, the, the historic district, into the park directly. And you'll notice this bridge right here. It's, one of, it's, it's sort of on par with the Brooklyn Bridge in terms of being one of the great civil engineering um, uh, structures in the, in the country, uh, Eads Bridge. Charles Eads, a competitor with Roebling. And it has all of these portals to it. This amazing piece of uh, 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 civic architecture that was being squandered by being across from a 1200 car garage. So this was a, another huge important moment of being able to tear this down, shape the land and make the only accessible link between the riverfront and the city uh, and on that important corridor and start to shape um, the uh, land and the landscape to being something that it was not just a, uh, sort of a slave to the message about this, but actually this is the place where you have people living and you could actually use the park without necessarily going to see the arch. Um, one of the really wild pieces we got to do was to build uh, access from the, the street levels in the middle of the Eads Bridge directly into the arch grounds. And that was, again, a new accessibility. And there was a huge community behind this that helped arm us. And it, it allows uh, a sort of an amazing gestural approach, not just you know, for any of the major accessibility issues, but for all to come into this despite the grand axes of the arch. And then below is your entrance from the riverfront, as sort of a gateway. So one of those portals, this was your view of the arch. You can barely see it out there, but it was basically this massive, no one would go there. <laughs> for good reason, and being the power of being able to open this up into this world of uh, inviting you in was incredible. They, if we had just started with this, we would have never gotten there, but it was accessibility, solving the traffic problems, um, that, and giving them back land that, they, that should have been theirs. And I think that's, you know, um, you know I'm, I'm hopefully these are starting to have some resonance with the sort of kind of challenges that Waller Creek focuses. Um, this one definitely does because uh, we have, Waller Creek did, is not, uh, in the tunnel project, is not the sort of only sort of cyborg water feature <laughs> uh, is, uh, that we've worked on. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the tunnel project takes all the water coming down the creek, puts it in the lake, and then pumps it back up. And all of that's modulated through computers. Um, we're actually in active conversations about how do we actually create nature, actually uh, thrive in this situation. It's not just a fountain. We're not just turning it on and letting it trickle. 
We're talking about artificial storms where we pull water through because the, the Texas planting, that's how it propagates. That's how it sort of does well. It's not from a constant trickle. So this is back in Brooklyn. This is basically a super block. It was, you know, purchased to become a botanic garden. There was no, no water feature, no stream, no, you know, just, just a, a slightly sloped piece of land. But botanic gardens are all about fantasy. And it's all about creating this sense of, you know, suspended disbelief. And, you know, in the middle of the stream was the merchild sculpture. And then you had the Japanese pond and a room of trellises. And this, this great stuff, that was, land, that was landscape architecture before it was called landscape architecture. But the dirty secret here is that basically they used potable water, dug a hole, filled it up, let it run in a ditch and put it in another pond at the end that would then overflow into a drain and go to the drainage system for a hundred years. <laughs> so we had this interesting, um, I mean, we were, you know, we, we brought this up and <laughs> it was a little uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, but so we came up with a strategy. Like we got to do something about this. This is this is a truly water resources are you know exceptionally important, and they are here. There's an incredible history of manipulating waterways in this state, and the water issues are, are very tense. So this was the existing watershed. Um, basically, almost 22 million gallons a year were pushed into this site. And then there was some watershed, and it at 27 million gallons were just dumped. And the DEP was not thrilled with that, but there's nothing you can do. It's a, an important um, institution. So when we came along to meet uh, meet with them and say, we're only going to put less than a million gallons into this just to help supply and deal with uh, evaporation and things like that. We're going to increase the watershed, so now all of that watershed's not going into your drainage system. And we're only going to let 7 million gallons a year um, eventually go into, your, into the system. They were, your permits are done. You can do anything. <laughs> and, but the, the, the key agent here in making this happen is what's something I've uh, donned the iPond. It is the first pond connected to the internet on a weather station. <laughs> the way this works, that's a picture of, it's not as, you know, Stephen Jobs didn't design it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's connected to a weather station and the weather forecast on the line, and it's tied to the overflow drain. Basically, it can anticipate weather, and it learns over time. And if it's anticipating a storm, it drains the water out into the drain so that when the storm happens, it fills back up and keeps it on site and recirculates it. So it's sort of fascinating how ta technology is part of the story of na actually naturalizing and taking this total artificial waterway and making it more of a real natural system. And for any hydrology geeks out here, this is, the red was the kind of water that systematically they just had to dump into the system and now it's projected as a reaction to the weather, which makes sense. Um, I mean, literally this is what it was before, which is like you taking your, the garden hose in your yard and laying it on the, and turning it on and walking away for several years, <laughs> this is what you would get. <laughs> um, but this is our project now, and this is literally days after it's finishing. It's just the ribbon cutting was, um, yeah, just days ago. Um, and we have all sorts of interesting things about how it comes to the pond, the four bay that uh, filters, it's a walkway, but it filters the sediment so we don't, so the pond that we are gonna be uh, draining into the uh, storm into the storm system isn't full of sediments so this rock embankment actually filters out anything coming from downstream and that's built so you can see the flow there it's very turbid and ugly and it comes out nice and clean um, and this is during construction one of the anticipating the storms where it drained down and then filled back up soon after that so um, now uh, again that has obvious references to some of the challenges and interesting uh, developments we are going to encounter with Waller Creek. Um, and I hope this is, you know, starting to, you know, 
reflect on that, like what landscape architecture keeps reinventing what it's doing. At St. Louis was, we were traffic transportation engineers. Here we became hydrologists, you know. Um, so now Houston, and this idea of uh, what is it? planning, invention and planning. You know, maybe I don't want any planners to get offended here. You can invent too, but, <laughs> um, but Houston is sort of, at least in my opinion, the ultimate sim city. It is got all the parts of the city, but it's full of just completely fragmented spaces and um, indeterminate space. So, um, and this tells it all, I think. <laughs> the things we're, we're, we, are, we are looking at. We were hired by the, um, um, the uh, it's for a Greenway project where we're basically assessing the entire city in terms of all of these spaces um, and starting to look at, oh, that got washed out. Um, basically a whole series of already funded and sort of initiative as laid out in a geography of the city um, and starting to collate them into a, for this Greenway master plan, into a more coherent set of projects. So if you take all these scraps, all these scatological things, which some of which ha have funding and bring them together, because normally that's the way the city's gotten the way it is, is that all that stuff happens in silos. That the Bayou people will pay for their Bayou work and trails people will pay for their, and so uh, their work. So this is, we're being asked to say, what can we sort of gel together of this incredibly complex landscape to not only make more coherent projects, but create um, incredible impacts to people who live in this environment where they actually have access to open spaces and public space or just ways to ride a bike here and there. And so that was just, this is all of Houston, what we call the constellations, the sort of bundling of, of just um, indeterminate spaces and opportunities and little funding sources describes a whole new set of landscapes. Um, and, and this is the, the sort of beautiful mess that we're <laughs> currently mapping and this is probably gonna go on for a good while, but we've been incredibly encouraged because as we um, go out there and do field work and start to do take all sorts of new data sets and overlay this. This is all different fund, this is a landscape of money, basically. And we're finding our project here. So, you know, all this is in, rep, you know, hindsight's 2020 on, on these projects. So now that we start to talk about Waller, it's, it's harder, but, but if I had to give a guess, you know, one of the things when we think about Austin is it, it's um, such an incredible, great place to be. Um, everyone wants to be here, third fastest growing uh, city. Um, but it's happening so fast, even in the time I've been here, I've, there are places where I don't recognize. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's sort of in the name of the Waller Peak Conservancy. What are, we, what are we conserving here? Because there is a little bit of the creek that will that are actually natural fragments that are of great value and we can, can conserve, but everything's changing. You know, the tunnel has changed things. The, the, re the reconstruction for trails will change things. The massive amount of development will change things. And I feel like the, the core thing that we're trying to find in sort of the strategic thinking and the, and the creative dialogues with people here is how do we hold on to Austin I think that's really a big part of probably what you guys come together to talk about in Imagine Austin. Because I just this is one of those uh, magazines you see in your hotel, but this one in Austin was pretty great. I sort of liked it. 158 people move here every single day. I mean, that's you know that's what the capacity of this room is a little bit. So maybe you're all those new people. <laughs> this makes no sense to you. Um, but the tunnel project has opened the door and you can obviously see it already that the, uh, the, uh, the project is right for pr development and they're out there, they're doing it and we're keeping pace and finding a way to sort of divine what in Austin, the spirit of Austin can be here still um, and that we don't lose this. And, and it's right at the crossroads of, uh, you know, public and private development, these situations are just all over 
Austin where it looks like not a lot's going on, but it's just, it's all on the drawing boards. Uh, new rail lines, development, our, the Waller Creek project, uh, bridge replacements, and it's happening at an incredible rate. And then at, th at the time also, um, you know, the creek itself is a very delicate thing in many ways in terms of its, the, the beautiful parts, and I don't suspect many people have seen those. Um, you've probably gotten more of those moments where you're like, I wish I had not seen that or smelled that or <laughs> felt that. But um, it is, it's, it's a very hard uh, thing to, to tackle and, and, and to find a way to um, make this into Aust into a place for Austin. And I think the invention here and what we were, again, returning to how excited we are, were, in the competition and are now about the crafting of a place that is not only um, just a, a rote public space that's great, a trail system, good, but that truly is inclusive and truly means something to um, a changing population. And that's a total moving target. So how do you have your foot in both sides of what Austin was, what Austin is? Is there is there an essence there? And I use this um, diagram we use, which is tracking our chain of parks concept, which is how to take the, the uh, creek restoration and elevate it to something that's about drawing people in and bringing east and west sides together, creating new programs, new uh, invitations to um, uh, participate in this landscape and to make a walkable district. It's crazy how, how much uh, you can just walk through here if, uh, right now if you have muck boots, but if you actually have a trail system, it's amazing. And then all of the right-of-ways in yellow, all these new connections, two streets into this place. And I'm going to show you a really weird <laughs> image here for a second. This is um, this idea in ecology, ecology about niches, that the complexity of the form in a landscape begets a gr great more diversity in species and, and types of occupy. So there's sort of an analogy here about talking about this place we're creating, that its complexity, if honed in the right way, allow, creates the sort of natural diversity that we're animals too, that you know, some want to be in the sun, some want to be in the shade, some want to you know, be there for events, some want to be there for um, just ca small, peaceful moments. And so these are the slices of all these images in, in Waller Creek about that we're hopefully aiming to catch all you people into uh, in our net of, of uh, all these exciting new forms of open space um, to, to, to collect and bring people together. And this for us is the key mission of bringing this project to Austin and holding onto Austin um, that, that we love. So I'm going to end on this, this slide just for the, uh, the reflection on the, the landscape architecture part of this. Um, it's, we're really, um, we're really uh, just incredibly invested in what landscape architecture can do right now in terms of uh, fostering a convergence of interest in these environments and, and just sort of the, we actually find that to be the most creative part of what we do. And it sort of starts with breaking these silos of there's nature and then there's cities and, and, and we really have started to understand that what, the way we're trained is to under, uh, understand ecology not necessarily for just as a scientific perspective but from an experiential perspective. What, what draws us to these things and urbanism from an environmental perspective. So we're really cross-pollinating that from the way that we're trained and we feel that that's um, an exciting place to start reimagining Austin, uh, Waller Creek.